Okay, um, hopefully you can hear me at the back. It doesn't matter, I'm not going to use it. Okay, so Harry's, Harry's given us a, um, a sort of nice taste of some of the slides that I was going to show you on the work that we're doing. So liquid crystal lasers, basically it's an umbrella term really, it encompasses quite a few different types of liquid crystal lasers. But for all of them, um, it's true to say that really the main ingredients are the same as what you'd have with any type of laser, which is some form of a cavity, um, which is the... So the two, the, two, the two main ingredients that you have, um, as you do for any type of laser, is, is some kind of cavity, a feedback mechanism, uh, and a gain medium. And this can come in, in lots of different forms for the liquid crystal lasers. So as I said before, the, the term liquid crystal laser basically encompasses quite a few different types of lasers. And really, you can break them down into sort of three main categories. They are the photonic band edge laser, which is where you basically got feedback uh, due to large density of photon states at the edge, either edge of the photonic band gap, which is what Harry was referring to in our stuff just now. Um, you can also have a defect mode laser, which is where you introduce some form of defect, whether that be a slip in the phase of your twisted structure or actually a thin defect layer uh, between a periodic structure. And that's, this is where you get a, a, an unmode, a peak in the density of states within the gap. Uh, and the final one, which is a bit more of a sort of unusual and unconventional type of laser, which is the so-called random laser, and you may have seen this in lots of other types of materials, it's quite a, a hot topic at the moment. And this is where actually there's no uh, well-defined cavity, they're mirrorless, but they're not uh, modeless, uh, and the, the mode structures themselves not come from a well-defined periodic structure, or between mirrors, it comes from the, the intense multiple scattering of light. Now, unfortunately, in 45 minutes, there's no way I can cover all of those. So, for today, I'm just really going to focus in the next 45 minutes on this type of laser, which is the band edge laser. So, the way I've just tried to structure this um, is to give an introduction into how photonic band edge lasers work and, and how liquid crystals fit in with this. Photonic band edge lasers doesn't necessarily prescribe only to liquid crystals, you can use it with photonic crystal structures. Uh, and then some of the general emission characteristics that we see for these types of liquid crystal lasers. How you might go about, about improving the performance, which is what we've been interested in in Cambridge. Uh, because of the beauty of liquid crystals and their sensitivity to a range of external stimuli, uh, it's very easy to tune these um, in terms of their wavelength, their emission wavelength can be tuned um, when they're subjected to different external stimulus. Um, different forms of processing, and, and Harry's already alluded to that a little bit in his slides. Uh, and then, um, whilst this majority of this will relate to the car aromatics, I'll then go on to show um, sort of similar studies that have been done uh, within the other liquid crystal phases for that this is uh, applicable to, before we go on to give a summary. Hopefully I can get that all done uh, within the time. So, uh, the origins of the photonic bandage laser, this is all sort of really, um, I like the platform for this, was, the idea of a photonic crystal, which was the melding really of classical electromagnetics uh, with solid state physics. Uh, and then, and that was sort of the, the, the peer pioneering work of Sajid John and Ilya Yablanovic from Photonic Crystals in, in 1987. And then in 1994, there was this paper on the idea of a photonic band edge laser, which is where it was realized that at the edge of these photonic band gaps, um, you basically get a very large. Um, gain region because you get uh, the group velocity itself uh, decays to zero and basically what you get is for an infinite structure you get a standing wave whereas inside the gap itself uh, the wave is, is evanescent and it's purely imaginary and so this is just really an example this is your gap and then these are the this is what I when I refer to band edges it's this either side of this band gap structure 
So basically, you could get this, it was, it was postulated you could get this very large amplification, so much so that it would support lasing. So from the point of view of liquid crystal requirements, what do you need? Um, well, any old liquid crystal phase isn't going to do. You've got to make sure that you have um, optical anisotropy, which you do have in most liquid crystal phases. But the, the key feature here is the periodic structure. And it's the combination of these two that gives you the photonic band gap. And so this is really where it sort of then selects which liquid crystal phases. Uh, I'm going to skip that. Which liquid crystal phases are actually applicable for photonic band edge lasers. Uh, and they are the ones that have periodic structures, so the chiromatic, which Harry's already mentioned, uh, the chirospectic C phase, and then the two blue phases, blue phase one and blue phase two, which both have cubic symmetry, uh, are also uh, able to support lasing. These two structures give you one-dimensional photonic band gaps. These two, however, because of the three-dimensional periodicity, give you three-dimensional photonic band gaps. So, just as examples, these are actually, this is sort of, experimental data of transmission spectra, just sort of showing you in one dimension the photonic band gaps that you see within the different phases. So this is the band gap in the chiromatic phase, this is the band gap in the chiromatic C, and then this is the, the typical band gap you'll see uh, within one of the platelets of blue phase 1 or blue phase 2. There is a caveat, however, uh, and that is that these aren't complete photonic band gaps in the, in the strictest sense of the word. I mean, complete photonic band gap is something where you, there's a region of energies where the uh, photonic structure itself restricts the propagation of electromagnetic waves, regardless of their frequencies and their polarization. And that's not true for the crystal structures because they're actually only partial photonic band gaps. Uh, and this is an example, really, for a right-handed chiromatic structure. Um, they're sensitive to the polarized in input, input polarization, so the type of circular polarization that you have. So if you've got a right-handed helix, then you see for right circular polarized light, you see your band gap, but there is no band gap for the left circular polarized light. And that's true for all of those periodic structures, all, all those uh, liquid crystal phases, the chiromatic, chiromatic, and blue phases, they all give you this uh, partial photonic band gap. But that's not the end of the world. So chiromatics is photonic band edge lasers. Um, I sort of won't go over this, how he's already introduced chiromatics here. Uh, but just two things I want to point out. Uh, is that uh, the important length scale here is actually the, the, the pitch divided by two, so the pitch being, of course, as you know, the distance over which along the helix axis the director rotates by 360 degrees. Um, but because of the, uh, for the director, the end minus, is minus n invariance, the periodicity of these structures is only half the pitch. So that's the important length scale, that's really what defines um, our band structure and, and also where our emission wave is. So you can simulate the, the band gap of a, of a chiromatic if you know its optical properties and you know its pitch, and there's been huge amounts of work done on this over the last 60 years, uh, so I'm not going to go into detail. Uh, just to say that really what I wanted to point out, so you can, the nice thing about polysteric or chiromatic crystals is that, that along the helix, if you consider the light travelling parallel to the helix axis, there's an exact solution to Maxwell's equations, there's an exact analytical solution, it's not the, the same case for the oblique, for the oblique modes, but Certainly parallel to that, you can actually solve Maxwell's equations. And what you end up with is a sort of nice relationship showing the um, extremes of the band gap itself. So this uh, term here, this is the refractive index um, perpendicular to the director uh, within the sort of local chiromatic layers. This is the pitch of your helix, and then this is this value here is the refractive index parallel to the, to the director within the local chiromatic layer. So this really defines our uh, gap of our, of our photonic band gap. And so this just, these, this, these was theoretical results just show um, for different uh, number of pitches going from 5 to 30, you can see your nice well-defined structure or what nice defined band gap. Uh, and then the dotted lines here just show, of course, for the opposite sense of handedness of circular polarization when there's no gap at all. Now, as I said, these are the important points, the two band edges. So what you get if you look at the density of photon states, which you can also simulate from, from these structures once you've done your calculations um, for, the, uh, for the reflection spectrum, what you find is that at the two edges, you get a very strong uh, peak uh, or divergence in the density of photon states. <coughs> the density of photon states is typically defined as the inverse of the group velocity. So in an infinite structure, the density of states diverges. Uh, but in a finite structure, you can actually calculate it. This looks like a rather complex expression, but don't worry too much. It's based on 
uh, a transmission coefficient term that you can work out for the helical structure based on a sort of real and imaginary term for the two different eigenmodes in the structure. And what I want to point out is really uh, this, is, this is the two modes of interest. So this is what correlates with our laser modes. And from the point of view of lasing, the interesting point here is that there are only two well-defined modes. So unlike a fabric Perot cavity where you've got lots of modes and you've got to have engineering another way of selecting that mode, the structure itself only has two very well-defined discrete modes. I mean, there are potentially other modes of the higher orders where you see the density of photon states decreases as you move further away from the edges, um, but the difference in gain between these two regions is very large, and so actually all you will see is, is these two are the dominant modes. And then there's an additional criterion in selection in terms of isolating just one of these modes. So, it's these two. These are the band edge modes corresponding to the density of photon states, and that's easy to simulate. So why is the density of photon states an important parameter? As I said, it's the inverse of the group velocity. Uh, the reason that it's important is that this is really, um, if you go back to Fermi's golden rule for spontaneous emission inside these types of structures, the spontaneous emission rate depends upon the density of photon states, as well as another term, which is the projection of the electric field vector onto the, the dipole moment of the die itself. I'll come back to this shortly. Um, so this is why it's important. So you can see here, it's a linear relationship. So the larger the density of photon states at your edge, the greater um, your rate of spontaneous emission. So we want to make that as maximum as possible. Um, we did some studies theoretically on trying to understand, and, and as other groups have done as well, understand the, the profile of the density of states in problematic structures. And we find some interesting things uh, when you take into account losses within the structures. This could be just scattering losses or absorption losses within a coronamatic crystal. Uh, and what we find is that actually the dominant mode, so without losses, the, uh, the density of photon states at the short wavelength edge is, is the dominant mode, uh, and uh, whereas the, the long wavelength is, is, is small in terms of the, the maximum available density of states. But that switches over when you take into account losses, and so this now becomes the dominant mode. So for all the stuff I should show uh, in the following slide, uh, we're really going to focus now just on lasing from the long wavelength band edge. So we're just going to isolate that particular mode. What about the spatial profile of the energy density? Where well, you can also solve, you can also uh, work this out uh, relatively straightforward because you can solve Maxwell's equations, as I said. So you can work out the energy density within the structure, and you see a very nice smooth uh, profile of the, electro, uh, the electromagnetic field density within the cell. So this is just as you move through. It's actually very similar to the fundamental mode of a heavy Perot laser. Um, and this is a sort of 3D plot showing uh, how the energy density varies as you grow across the modes in the structure, and this is just looking down on it. Uh, the interesting thing here is it's quite different because of the sort of soft nature, if you like, of the, of the helical structure. Um, it's quite different to having a periodic dielectric structure, where what you see instead, rather than as a nice smooth profile uh, in terms of the energy density through the cell, you see uh, sort of this very uh, oscillating structure. That's because the energy now is confined usually in the high refractive index regions, and then it sort of drops. So you don't get quite. So the nice thing with the helical structure is you get this really nice, nice profile of the energy distribution throughout the cell. One thing I was, as I sort of referred to before, there's also another selection mechanism here. Um, in addition to the fact you've just got these two modes either at the side of the band edge. Uh, sorry, either side of the photonic band gap, and that is that actually at each mode, at each edge, the orientation of the electric field vector is different. So for the short wavelength edge, the electric field vector always points perpendicular to the director, whereas at the long wavelength edge, the electric field vector of the optical mode itself points along the director. And that has a consequence in terms of coupling with the die, because of the die guest host effect, the die molecules tend to align preferentially with the director, and so you get more coupling into the, um, into the long wavelength edge than you do uh, to the short wavelength edge. And if you incorporate the fact that when you have losses as well, the long wavelength edge is the dominant mode, this is why really all the stuff that we've done has really focused just on looking at long wavelength edge, but on a band edge lately. In terms of the gain medium, um, the sort of most common gain medium that's been studied is the laser dye. Um, for those of you not familiar with the laser dye, Basically, it's a four-level process. Uh, for the laser dyes themselves, you can, you can draw very complex uh, electronic structures. Um, but all I want to sort of uh, highlight here is that basically 
From the ground state, you've got an absorption of the photon uh, coming in from the pump beam. It decays non-relatively very quickly, of the order of, sort of less than a few picoseconds, uh, and then decays uh, radiatively so in the form of fluorescence, and then the molecule relaxes back to its ground state. And this, that's why it's a four-level process, because there's four separate points here. And this is true for all types of laser dyes. So an example of a laser dye that this is sort of the DCM uh, is one of the workhorses that's been used for liquid crystal lasers. And the reason for this is it's very soluble in liquid crystal hosts, uh, and also it has a very broad fluorescence spectrum. Uh, so you've got quite a, a broad range of wavelengths over which you can emit. And so this is a sort of typical measurement we might do when we're assessing new dyes or new dye structures. We look at the absorption curve here. So this, this gives us an indication of all the wavelengths that we can pump at. And then this is the fluorescence curve showing all the, all the wavelengths that we can potentially emit at. So, excuse me, so basically we take our periodic structure, our carbonatic crystal, which has got a photonic band gap, uh, and we try and match this long wavelength edge to the fluorescence curve, ideally at the gain maximum of the dye itself. Um, so we match from our long wavelength edge and hopefully match them up. And we do that chemically, so we make it through our mixtures. We adjust the concentration of chiral additive for our carbonatic mixture so that this, these two are co-located. And then when we look at the output of the fluorescence, you can clearly see the signature of the density of photon states and how you get this first mode is very strong in terms of fluorescence and then it decays. So it's almost a sort of resembling the, the density of states. You've got suppression in the band gap here. Um, it's not completely suppressed, and that's simply because uh, here we were capturing unpolarized emission, uh, and if you actually broke this down into the circular components, you would find that the uh, component of circular polarization that was of the opposite sense to the helix, you would see a normal fluorescence curve, which is where this emission is coming from because there's no band gap. And then for the case of the uh, circular polarization, in this case it's right circular polarized, when that matches with the uh, right handedness of the helix, then you see the density state profile where you get a complete suppression of the emission within the, the band gap. So, the other term that I mentioned in, in the uh, Fermi's Golden Rule was the spontaneous emission rate, was the density of photon states, and this projection term of the electric field vector on the dipole moment. Um, Jürgen Schmidtke has done quite a lot of work on this and showed that you could actually express this projection of the dipole moment, so this is our dye molecule uh, aligned at some angle to the director. <coughs> Excuse me. And this projection term can be calculated in terms of the ellipticities of the actual mode itself. But the important parameter here is the order parameter of the die. So the greater the order parameter of the die, i.e. the more ordered this transition dipole moment is with the director itself, means you get a, a greater value of this projection. Um, and so you, you've got a greater spontaneous emission rate. And you can actually measure that. And we, that's something that we do. You can measure the, the size of this um, order parameter term just from the absorption properties or even the fluorescence properties, the emission properties, and it's, it's just a simple relationship. So those are the important parameters you've got to take into account. Once you've made your sample and then you optically pump it, uh, so the, all these samples that we look at are optically pumped. Um, so this is these donut shaped things are supposed to be represent the dye, you pump with the let's say the, the 532 nanometers, the second harmonic of a YAG laser, uh, and then provided you've got everything matched up nicely, you then should have uh, a mission that's slightly longer wavelength corresponding to where the band edge is overlapping with the fluorescence curve. As Harry said in his slides, one of the nice things about this is that the emission is always along the helix axis, and so it doesn't actually matter where you pump from. So you can pump, as he said at the end, from, from normal to the glass substrate, or you can pump along uh, uh, parallel to the substrate. And e whatever way you do it, you're always going to get emission uh, along the helix axis, depending on what your alignment is. However, uh, there is a magic angle of pumping. And if you get that right, um, then you get very, very strong absorption of the pump beam into your threshold for your laser can drop quite dramatically. So actually, uh, which direction you pump is quite important, although you're free to choose a few things. Uh, a very loose relationship that Belyakov came up with, um, because actually trying to get a, a full solution to this is quite difficult because of the fact that you, there's no solution to Maxwell's equations for the oblique modes. Um, but you can approximate it in a very loose way in terms of the um, ratio of your, of your laser frequency to your pump frequency. But this can have a big effect. I mean, if you drop your, your 
threshold for lazy requires a large factor here. So once we do pump, here's lazy at the band edge. You can see actually when you zoom in, it's not quite at the band edge. That's just because for finite thickness devices, they don't actually line up with the, the peak in the transmission spectra. The, density, the peak in the density of states is just offset from that. Um, but as you go to more thicker samples, the two become co-located. And uh, the initial demonstrations of lasing at the band edge, lasing in car uh, was reported some years ago, but in terms of the context of understanding it as being this density of photon states and, and corresponding to the band edge, the really the, sort of, the stuff that's kick-started this and triggered this work uh, was the work by Kopp and Teheri et al. Uh, in, the 19, in the sort of late 90s, early 2000s. So what do we see from the general emission characteristics of these samples? Well, uh, we see this sort of Fraunhofer ring, uh, far field structure, and this is understood in terms of the periodic structure. This uh, and Galact did a lot of work on this. Um, and you see, depending on the pump beam and the quality of the sample, this isn't always the case, uh, but as long as you've prepared things very well, then you can get a very nice near Gaussian uh, diffraction limited beam. Uh, the, the quality of the emission spectra you get, the, whether you get a narrow line width or broad, rather messy line width, is really dependent also on the, on the quality of the sample that you prepare. So if you end up with a, a very polydomain polymatic liquid crystal, your emission spectra is, consists of quite a lot of different modes because you've got different regions of slightly different pitch. Uh, so it's really quite important that you make sure you, you form a, a very nice monodomain, and that has sort of quite a big effect in terms of the line width. You can end up with very nice. Uh, narrow line of the samples, and I think the lowest we measured is about 60 picometers, um, which has been sort of, uh, restricted by uh, the resolution limit of our spectrometer, so it may well be even less than that. So, in terms of, before I go on to sort of discuss a little bit about improving the performance of the liquid crystal, uh, and anything that we've done with these liquid crystal lasers, we've tried to characterize them in terms of two fundamental properties that, that characterize their performance, uh, and that is the excitation threshold. Um, which is basically the, the discontinuity in the differential here. Uh, not always easy to identify if it's quite a smooth transition. And the other term is the, flow, the, the slope efficiency, which we use in the percentage. This is a sort of a typical laser term. And this is the uh, ratio of the output energy to the input energy once you get above the threshold itself. So, and I think this addresses one of the questions that was asked earlier uh, in Harry's talk is um, the thickness of the layer. Our, our typical finding is that you can get anything from about 5 to 40 microns um, will give you lasing, um, but it does have a big impact in terms of the threshold and slope efficiency of the resulting laser itself. And so this shows the excitation threshold as a function of the cell thickness. And, and to do these measurements, we did it with a single sample, a single pyromatic, but we made a wedge cell, and we just translated across this beam, so we're looking at samples with different numbers of pictures in so different cavity lengths. And uh, you can see that there's quite a dramatic, the threshold is very high when the sample is very thin, and we didn't actually see anything lower than 5 microns. And as you increase the, the thickness, you go through a sort of minimum before it starts to increase again, and scattering losses and absorption losses take over. And the slope efficiency shows the inverse of what the threshold is doing, and you get this sort of peak. And our, our general finding uh, for the types of liquid crystals that we've always looked at is that this peak occurs somewhere between 10 and 15 microns. So anything in between there is really where you're running at the sort of the maximum, uh, maximum efficiency in terms of the slope and, and the minimum threshold. So we've tried to understand that, we've done some work on this, I'm not going to go into detail on this, um, but uh, one of the students, Demis, has done a lot of nice theoretical studies on this, he's in the audience somewhere, so uh, do quiz him about his maths if, if, uh, on this. Um, oh, there's a mistake here, this should be, sorry, this should be parallel, there's something wrong with the fonts. Uh, but basically we were able to understand why you get this behaviour based on modelling the density of photon states and what we find is that if you plot the density of photon states as a function of the number of pictures then indeed there is a peak uh, in both cases and, and this resembles the plot of the slope efficiency very nicely. So this profile here fits the profile of the density of states very nicely in terms of uh, the number of pictures. The other thing that we see is that depending on the optical properties of the chiromatic itself and the optical anisotropy, uh, we find that the, the minimum uh, in the threshold or the maximum in the slope efficiency occurs at different cell thicknesses or pitches uh, depending on how big or how small the bioprint is. So this just shows two plots. 
This one here is for, I called alpha, this alpha is this term here. And these epsilons are for optical frequencies, uh, so not, not at uh, low frequencies. And uh, you can see that as you get a higher, basically a higher birefringence, then the minimum occurs earlier. And when we were able to, correspond to, to correlate that, and that actually you do see um, a shift to shorter number of pitches when you've got a higher optical anisotropy. In addition, you also see a larger maximum density of photon state, and that has an impact on the next. So, what, what I'm going to sort of say a few words about now is, is the stuff we've done and in terms of improving the performance of the liquid crystal lasers. And this really has required an approach from the materials, so we're working quite closely with the chemists. Uh, looking at the device architecture and how we can improve that, and also in, in terms of the pumping and processing conditions. So that it's really multifaceted. So, how we showed this slide a minute ago, in terms of the uh, change in performance that we saw, and we found it was quite dramatic over a range of materials. And so, you could be looking at sort of slope efficiencies that were rather low, and in some cases less than 1%. Uh, and just by choosing the right liquid crystal, you could, you could shoot that up to sort of 12 to 15%. Uh, the conditions for the thickness would be the same, the dye concentration, the pump, everything else would be the same, it's just the liquid crystal place that would be different. Uh, and the reason for this is that, uh, from what we were finding experimentally, is that the correlations were that liquid crystals that have high optical anisotropies or high biofringences and also high order parameters um, tend to exhibit very low and high, low threshold and high efficiency lasers. So that was the sort of design algorithm that we had and have, have continued through since. Um, and you can ask, you can understand it, although not completely quantitatively, you can understand it qualitatively just by looking at how the density of states, the maximum density of photon states, depends on the optical properties of the crystal itself. Uh, by mutagens, uh, we looked at because um, this, the previous study was with quite a range of chemical structures, so now we, we thought well, we'll just look at the biomutagens because the only change, as Harry said, is the number of units in the flexible space, and we know that they, were, they show very strong or even effects in, in things such as the phase transition temperatures uh, and the optical properties. Uh, and so, uh, sort of accordingly really, you see the same type of odd even effect with this. Uh, so that this has sort of been the reverse process of actually the flex electro-optic behavior in that actually now it's those with an even number of units in the space that are now the optimum for the laser. So whilst the odd ones are good for flex electricity, the even ones seem to be rather good for the lasers. And this one with an eight unit was our sort of maximum performance. So the, the liquid crystal structure is really quite important in terms of the quality of the laser here. What about the gain medium? Well, we looked at that. We, we, we had a look at different dyes just to see how big of an impact that has. Uh, so we took three sort of known commercial dyes. This is DCM, which I said was the workhorse, and then the two pyromethanes, which were developed uh, in the late 80s, early 90s. So these were developed as basically the sort of next generation of laser dyes. They're known to have very high quantum efficiencies in isotropic solvents, and also they have um, a very low triplet yield. So uh, these were known to be good performance in, in other solvents. We found in the crystals they also perform very well, and they actually make a big difference. So we're still pumping here with 532 nanometers, uh, so it's the same excitation wavelength, um, but the change in performance is quite staggering. You go from <coughs> at maximum 10% slope efficiency up to about 30% just by changing the dye that you're using. So the emission wavelengths are roughly the same, uh, but the performance is substantially better. And why is this? Well, the, the main reason for this is that just the different dyes have different quantum efficiencies in the liquid crystal host, and some combine well with liquid crystals and some don't. And what we found with DCM is that although it's been reported that the quantum efficiency is rather good at DCM, in the liquid crystal it wasn't so good, it was quite low. Uh, and, the, and the pyromethanes were substantially higher. And so the impact of that is that combined with the better absorption of the pyromethanes, these are just better performing dyes. Um, some of this behavior with concentration you can understand by the fact that the quantum efficiencies themselves, as well as the lifetimes, all vary with the concentration of the dye. And the limit in terms of weight that we tend to find is that above 2.5% weight of these commercial laser dyes is about as far as you can go before things really sort of go pear-shaped in terms of the laser performance. Now, one of the things we said is that, of course, laser emission in these structures occurs uh, along the helix in both directions, so you have emission um, in, in, sort of in, in both exit windows of your liquid crystal cell, which is a bit wasteful. So, one thing you can do is, is to engineer in mirrors um, and actually have a, what's called a single emission window, 
And you can do this in a number of different ways. You can have mirrors, you can have reflective polysteric films like this that we prepared for different colours. So what you can do is you can get both a double pass of the pump beam, so you improve your pumping efficiency of your liquid crystal laser, and you also get a double pass of the LC laser, so you get one single emission window. We, so there are a number of reports, I should have mentioned, that did this. Oh, this is only two, but there was lots where they were playing with this. We decided to have a go at this ourselves and have a single emission window. The only difference that we did was we added a silicon substrate rather than having a glass substrate, which was what all the other studies had done. Uh, and the reason for this was to try and improve our thermal management of our liquid crystal lasers. Uh, and the thermal conductivity of silicon is substantially higher, it's always a magnitude higher than glass. Uh, and we found that this had a dramatic improvement on the efficiency. So here is the performance of glass cells. So it's the same liquid crystal and dye. By this stage, we'd isolated what the best performing liquid crystals and dyes were. So we put them into our cell. Uh, the two differences here, one's the open circle, which just has, on, on the outer substrate, has an anti-reflection coating. And when we go to the silicon cell, you almost double the efficiency. And the highest we've recorded so far is 70%. This one is here is for 60%. Uh, and also the lifetime behavior of this is much improved. So this silicon substrate seems to make a big difference in terms of managing the thermal aspects of the liquid crystal laser. Uh, so we looked at uh, to, to some of the repetition rates. Uh, so one of the known problems with liquid crystal with uh, dye lasers is that their response to um, uh, well, so-called bleaching, and so as you go to higher repetition rates, the system keels over, uh, and this is what you see here. And this is something we studied to begin with. Uh, so these are different repetition rates you see it fall off quite quickly. Uh, so this is the output if you're running at one hertz, it's nice and stable, but as you soon to approach 20 hertz, it drops off dramatically within seconds. And the reason for this is that basically it's a combination of thermal effects, uh, optical um, degradation, and also sort of a, a, a build-up of the triplet states. Uh, you can get around that to some degree if you play with the concentration of the dye and you increase the thickness. You can improve this, uh, and you can you can reduce the bleaching effects. When we looked at just the spontaneous emission itself, not lasing at all, you see the same sort of behaviour. And it was really understood in terms of a, a, a dye depletion effect. Uh, and our conclusions were that if you could reduce the concentration and, and made this pump area smaller, you could reduce that dye depletion. And that, that made a big effect. So now, rather than getting to, to so 20 hertz and the system killed over, we could suddenly reach 500 or 1,000 hertz. And we're just limited here by the pump source that we have, without any change in the circuit efficiency. So you could run at a kilohertz quite happily for hours uh, without any degradation in the performance just by changing the, the properties of the, of the dye and the efficiency. Other work that's been done, people have looked at uh, glassy polysterics, uh, and having a, a polysteric glass can also improve the performance. This is just one of the cardomatic with a, a, a DCM dye, where you can see they sort of fall over quite dramatically. And this is the glassy polysteric, where it's, it's quite independent at the time. So going to polysteric glasses, so again, this is through materials design, you can improve the performance. Um, another way, which is what we decided to try and do at the time, was to say, okay, rather than having one spot that was bleaching uh, where we want to put a lot of energy in, we actually split it into lots of spots. Uh, so we create a lens array approach, a laser array. And this, this approach was actually done in big source and vertical cavity surface emitting lasers uh, as a way of improving the output power, so getting much higher powers than you could get normally. The nice thing about this is that if, if all of these are out of phase, then your output scales as the number of elements in your laser array. If, however, all your elements are in phase, then your output scale is as the number squared. So you can get a huge improvement in the output efficiency. Even if each spot is only delivering a small amount of energy, if you have 100 spots, or I think they can't remember, this is 5 by 5, we've done hundreds, um, then you can get huge outputs from this uh, rather sort of single sample. The other thing you can do with the arrays, as Harry showed, is you Combine a number of dyes together that emit over the visible spectrum. So we just took a sample. And combine them together, you can make a multicolored output uh, with our lens array. So you can get red, green, and blue arrays. And this is very simple to make because you just fill one sample, uh, sorry, one side of the cell with a short pitch uh, liquid crystal material with uh, a blue laser dye in it and a green laser dye. And on the other side, you put in a long pitch system with a red laser dye. And where they meet together, uh, forms the pitch gradient, so you don't, you don't have to do any of that yourself. 
and then when you optically excite it, you get this nice laser array uh, pattern out. And we, we played with this lots because uh, we were playing with lots of different colours and lots of different combinations, but it's really easy to do. Um, and you get very nice, interesting colours in the far field when all of these combine together. And I should say that actually when you, when you look at the output of one of these in the far field, uh, you get the same as what you would see for a single spot. Um, so it's, you're not trading off your uh, laser profile. We're going to skip that. Uh, we'll skip. We've looked at new structures. People have looked at new structures and improved the performance. We've done a similar thing here uh, through our chemists that have been synthesizing new molecules uh, to improve the solubility in the crystals and, and stability. Uh, in terms of tuning, the important things here are if controlling the pitch. Uh, or the refractive index properties, but really the dominant feature has been changing the pitch. And if you change the pitch, you, you can control the laser wavelengths. And people have looked at doing it spatially, uh, just translating the beam for a pitch gradient cell, uh, similar to what we made. And you can get a shift in the laser color. Uh, you can do temperature tuning, um, and this can either be in the form of a discontinuous tuning or continuous tuning, which is something we worked on um, for the sample. So you can get temperature tuning. Photo tuning through photoisomerization, you can change the pitch, and people have looked at doing this uh, and changing the shifting the laser wavelength. And you can, depending on the technique you use, you can see tuning of a few nanometers up to three or four hundred nanometers. So it really just depends on, on the type of tuning you get. And this one is a bit more extensive than the photo tuning using a photolysis process. There's been some mechanical tuning using cholesteric elastomers. There's some work done on this, and you can get some, some nice tuning from. But just by stretching, you're changing the pitch of the structure. And of course, the holy grail is using electric fields. Um, no one's sort of, we've tried it this uh, intensively, uh, and it's quite difficult to do. Uh, some people have used negative dielectric and isotropic crystals in the field. And by, by adjusting the voltage across the sample, you can shift the photonic structure. So you shift the band edge, and then consequently, you're shifting the laser wave. And here's a small shift here. Um, Jürgen Schmidtke has done it with in-plane fields. Um, the problem with the in-plane field approach is that actually the emission spectra is quite, quite noisy because um, the non-uniform field means that you don't preserve a nice single mode. Uh, what he did find was that the tuning range was quite different if you looked above the electrode itself or in between the gap. And the other thing that was quite important was you get a very nice continuous change. So it's not in discrete jumps, it's a continuous tuning mechanism. Uh, so I'll just sort of finish off. Uh, sort of processing, Harry alluded to this, you can do some, quite a lot with the processing of, of uh, carbonatic liquid crystal lasers. You can make polymerized, solid, flexible films that uh, you can, uh, when you optically illuminate them and pump them, you get obviously lasing along the helix, but if you compress it, you can change what the beam profile looks like in the far field uh, just by changing the curvature of the flexible substrate. You can paint them using emulsions, which is what we've done onto different substrates. The nice thing about this, is that you can either lie them side by side, you can stack them on top of each other, or you can even make a composite uh, film where you mix all of them into one, one emulsion and then just coat it down and you can get all your red, green and blue from one, one single sample. And this is what we show here, this is just side by side, different arrays, uh, and you get sort of a, a white light emission uh, when you stack them together and you've got your broadband spectrum. You can inkjet print them, as Harry says, um, using a sort of a deposition process. And this, this is really something you can't really do with inorganic semiconductor lasers, is, is do an inkjet printing process. So this is really where sort of the soft nature of the liquid crystals is really quite important. Uh, my final thing here is the sort of other phases that have been looked at. So I'll just finish um, in this. Uh, people look at the chorosmectics, so you can see sort of similar thing. One of the good things about the chorospectic seas is the ability to, to control the pitch with an electric field. In fact, this is probably some of the best uh, demonstrations of electric field tuning uh, that I've seen in, in, for a liquid crystal laser um, in terms of maintaining a single mode profile and, and at relatively low voltages compared to some of the, the work that's been done. And this is simply just having an in-plane uh, uh, helical structure and uh, applying a field from the dip to the helix and unwinding it and changing the pitch. Of course, there's the blue phases. Um, and the nice thing about blue phases is, of course, they're three-dimensional structures, so you get uh, lasing uh, not just in one dimension, but along all three uh, dimensions. And this was the work that was published in Nature Materials by Peter Palfrey's group. Uh, we also, this was in blue phase two, we also looked at lasing from the blue phases that uh, Harry was mentioning, uh, and we were, we were able to see 
this in very wide temperature range blue phases. So over a very wide temperature range, we, we could see single mode lasing from the blue phase one. Um, people have looked at uh, tuning these as well, both with electric fields, because you can control the lattice deformation uh, in blue phase one, uh, but you can also do it in blue phase two. And this was something that's been published in the last year or so. And more recently, people have looked at temperature tuning of uh, these structures as well. I'm going, to, I'm going to skip over this because I've made a plenty of of this. So why, just to finish, uh, why, why would, from a sort of technology point of view, why would you be interested in these liquid crystal lasers? You're optically pumping. Yes, they're very efficient, uh, and they're now approaching efficiencies you know, that's comparable with the best, sort of best state for dye lasers and thin film uh, optofluidic lasers. Uh, the reason we would be interested is this offers really a sort of a, a very small element tunability uh, laser. So this here is just an example of a tie sapphire laser with an OPO. We've got something quite similar on our labs. Uh, it's a very big device, and, and the optical parametric oscillator is, allows us to convert the single wavelength, uh, in this case it's a um, frequency tripled, 3.5 nanometer YAG laser that goes through the optical parametric oscillator crystal, and we can go from 400 to 800 nanometers. But you can do the same thing with a little crystal laser because now you, use, you still use the same sort of 355 uh, YAG laser to pump it, but now your liquid crystal element, because it, as Harry says, it's only the width of a human hair, uh, you can, and as I showed, you can get lots of wavelengths from just one single sample, you can create a, a nice tunable laser. And this isn't, this, isn't a, uh, you know, this isn't a giant hand, this is really is very small, uh, and, um, and, and you can get sort of, and this one here does from 400 to 900 nanometers in terms of tuning, uh, and it really does work. So, uh, so that's really, I think, my hard to finish. Uh, this is a bit of a whistle-stop tour for liquid crystal lasers, but hopefully giving you an idea that there's different types. But with this talk, we talked about photonic bandage lasers, the different aspects, the, the emission characteristics, how you might improve it, and the fact that it's, it's very multidisciplinary. Uh, lots of ways of wavelength tuning uh, and, and lots of processing, and basically the future is bright with this. There's lots to do, uh, and I should thank basically the team under Harry's direction that's been doing all the stuff that we've done here in Cambridge in collaboration with uh, the Cambridge and uh, so that's where I'll finish. Thank you. can be imprinted with different structures, introducing sort of a different structure of helis, helis 6, right? It's not a homogeneous sort of uh, type of a cholesteric texture. Uh, can you get into anything interesting from a lasing perspective if you use this kind of, say, a resume? Um, so there are, yes, so there are, there are some things, I mean, people have seen some very interesting, particularly in droplets, uh, and uh, sort of a radial alignment of the cholesterics, and you can get, so you can get sort of an omnidirectional emission. And uh, you can even use the sort of liquid crystal laser emission as a way of identifying what the orientation of the structure is as well. So that's kind of nice way of seeing the defects in the yeah. Other questions? Do you have any idea of the career on planks? Yes. Yeah, so uh, that's something I didn't say actually. So uh, the career on planks is, it depends on the sample, because it depends on how good a quality of line you've got to begin with and how good the helix is. But it varies between about three and six millimeters. So it's better than an LED, but it's not the centimetres of a helium or something like that. And actually that has very interesting consequences for fill field imaging. So it's something that we're about to report on is, is you can make some very nice images from this because it doesn't, it's not plagued by speckle, uh, but it's, there's enough coherence there. And the temporal coherence is very, very high because of the narrow line width. So you get very high spectral purity, but without the, the degradation in images for speckle. Um, what type of frequencies can you pump it? Uh, well, it all depends on the dye. So it depends on the, the emitter that you put in. So we've, we've excited from anything from 355 up to 800 nanometers. Oh, not, not, not the wavelength, but like, you want to pulse the laser signal. If you want to pulse it. Yeah. So, uh, into, oh, so, so pulse width yeah. is that what you're going to do? So um, yeah. done sort of down to a few hundred picoseconds. Up to about six nanoseconds is what we've looked at so far. So 
Another question? <coughs> okay, if not, let's thank both the speakers.